Good evening, everyone. Give you all a very warm welcome to this anniversary service. I'd like to start our service by singing, Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Could we stand as we sing?
effect. Praise God. That was a wonderful day, the day that he brought us in. Praise God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We're going to come before the Lord, and we're going to remember those that are sick tonight and pray for them, that God will visit them wherever they are, in hospital or at home. We continue to pray for Wesley McElveen and uh, Brother Darren, too, that the Lord will bless them abundantly. June Bellingham needs the Lord, and we pray for Christina and Margaret Wright, who needs the Lord, David Loudon and Sammy Orr and Edna Scott and Beatrice McGarry. We continue to pray for Patsy Doherty and Alec Robinson, Dave Borland and Sam Bloomfield. We pray for Elizabeth McAreevy and Peter Moy and Joanne Peden. Philip Archibald uh, needs the Lord. He's ill today, and we just pray for him. Rene Hill also, and uh, Ray Laverty, Johnny McCurdy, and Gwenny Stewart. We pray for a 14-year-old boy who's got cancer, and we do lift that young man before the Lord and pray for him. Paula and Hazel and Jean Scott, and we remember Martin and Liz Moore. And we pray for Alison McClellan, Bobby Todd, and Bobby Archibald, Joan Hunter, and uh, Ellen Morris, Robert Hunter, and we pray for Elizabeth Henry, too. Pray for Esther, too, that the Lord will bless Esther Devaney, and uh, Philip Doak, still in hospital, and we pray for him. We pray for Gillian's mother, uh, who's just uh, finished chemo or radiotherapy, and we do pray for her. Uh, Victor Creelman is still in the Roddens, and we do pray for him. Uh, we've been asked to pray for the Reverend Stephen McCracken, that the Lord will be with him. He's been in hospital. He's out of hospital now, and we just continue to pray for him. Pearl Crawford needs the Lord, and we continue to pray for Pearl. We pray for Don Logan. Don's in hospital, sadly, and uh, we do pray for him very much, that the Lord will undertake for him. He's got a very bad uh, infection and chest infection, and uh, we do pray for him. He's a little better yesterday, but we just continue to pray that God will bless him abundantly. Uh, Martin McGarry and Tommy McCracken, we continue to pray for Stuart Boyd, and uh, we pray for uh, Lila's uh, daughter, Sharon, up in Belfast. She had been taken into hospital, uh, and we do pray very much for her, that God will be with her and undertake for her, and pray that everything will go well for her during these tests. We pray for Ruth McAleese, too, that the Lord will just undertake for Ruth. Uh, she definitely needs a miracle of God, and we do pray for that. We pray for Pastor Dempster, too. George Graham, George comes and preaches for us and sings uh, occasionally, and we do pray for George. He had a very bad accident in work, and we pray for him that God will bless him. James Fulton, uh, too, uh, we pray for him that God will bless him abundantly. David McHenry's daughter-in-law, she's got a heart condition, and we do pray for her that the Lord will bless her abundantly. We do pray for those that are bereaved tonight, that God indeed will visit those homes and comfort those that are bereaved tonight. We pray for those that will minister in song uh, to us. We pray that God will bless them abundantly and use them for the glory of God. And we pray for God's servant, that the Lord will bless him and use him for the glory of God in this time. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Let's bow in prayer. Our gracious God and eternal Father in heaven, in the lovely name of our Lord Jesus, we bow before thee. And heavenly Father, we thank you and praise thee, Lord, that we're found in the house of the Lord. We couldn't be in a better place than to be in the house of the Lord tonight, to worship and to praise and to exalt the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And why shouldn't we, Lord, when we think of all that you have done for us? Father, you've saved us. You've delivered us. You've set us gloriously and wonderfully free. We can say, I'm free from the fears of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of the past. I've traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free. Praise God, free at last. Father, we thank God for this freedom in Christ Jesus. And to know, Father, with, a, with confidence that we're going on one day to be with Christ. And the Bible says that is far better. Father, we pray for those that are sick tonight. Oh, God, there's so many that are ill, Lord. And, oh, Father, we just lay them at your feet and pray for them. Those in hospital, Lord. Father, <clears throat> will you touch them with your lovely nail-pierced hand and raise them right up, Lord, and make them absolutely whole again. And, Father, soon they'll be out with us again, worshiping and praising 
the Lord. Father, we pray that you'll bless every head bowed in your presence. We know that there are needs in this meeting tonight, Lord. There are those perhaps are even hurting. And, oh, God, we just pray that you will minister to them tonight in the Savior's name. Father, we pray for the group that will sing, the choir that will sing, Lord, and for Adele, Lord. We pray that your blessing be upon them, Father, that the anointing of God will be with them. Father, we pray for your, your servant, Brother Stuart, and we just pray, Father, for him. The anointing of God will be upon your servant, and Lord, that you will take him and use him. The message that you have laid upon his heart will be a rich blessing to each and every one of us. Father, we ask all these things in the lovely and precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're delighted to see you all this evening. We do give you a very warm welcome in the lovely name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some announcements uh, to make. First of all, this is our anniversary uh, service, and I'd like just at this time to thank all those, our own congregation, for their faithfulness down through the year, and uh, for indeed all those that contribute to music and to all these things that uh, you know what you do in the church. And we're very grateful and very thankful uh, to you for all those things. The music, we can't do without music, and we can't do without anybody. We all need, because we work together, and uh, this is why we have this uh, beautiful building, and we're grateful to God for every blessing and mercy indeed. We'd like to thank uh, the uh, sister, who uh, Esther, for collecting the, the little uh, pink box we have at the back there. It's for 50 peas, and uh, we have it over the years, and, and Esther gave us another 500 pounds for our fund, and we appreciate that very much indeed. Up to date, out of that little pink box, uh, we have had uh, 17,000 uh, pounds put through it. So we really do appreciate uh, your giving and thank you so much if you'd like a cd of any of our services you can have that by putting your name on the sheet at the back and we'll get you a cd a newsletter if you'd like a copy of our monthly newsletter you can have that as you leave the building uh, tonight uh, today and uh, uh, it's full of bits and pieces and uh, be very interesting uh, to you Looking forward to Wednesday at 8 o'clock as our prayer meeting. We're looking forward to another great time around the throne of heavenly grace as we pray and see God. It's a very important meeting. So come along and join with us uh, on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Bringing us through to next Lord, Lord's Day morning at 11.30 is our break of the bread service and Sunday school. And we pray that God will bless us there. Then the evening service at 6.30, our evangelistic service, and I will be the speaker at both those services. Incidentally, we are having supper tonight after the service, and we'd love you all to stay, if possible. Move into the minor hall, and uh, the ladies have prepared supper there. And so we're looking forward to having another fellowship with you uh, in the hall. I think those are all the announcements. We're delighted to have Videl. Uh, with us tonight uh, to minister. She's going to, first of all, minister in song. And then uh, the choir is going to come and sing for us. And then, finally, Adele is going to uh, play the flute. Or there's maybe a better name for that, but anyway. That will do. God bless you, sister. We'll, uh,
Lord, that was beautiful, wasn't it? Thank you, Adele, for uh, those two lovely pieces, and thank you to the choir sang a beautiful, beautiful number. We really do appreciate it. It was beautiful. And those uh, uh, photographs on the screen, it reminds us of some of the, the great old saints of God that have gone on to be with Christ. And we see some of those on the photographs. And uh, we will never, ever forget those people that were such a blessing uh, to the church uh, down through the years. The best is yet to come. We're delighted to have the Reverend Eric Stewart with us again. He's no stranger here, and uh, we're going to hand the whole desk over to him. God bless you, brother. Thank you, Pastor Ian. It's nice to be back uh, with you again at Mount Calvary. Lovely to see you all. So many faces that I recognize and names as well that I can put to them, and it's a joy to be with you all. We pray the Lord will really meet with us, touch us, and speak into our hearts. Uh, again, I'm sure you're very thankful to the Lord for his faithfulness to you, bringing you to another anniversary. It's quite a while since I was here for the first one, and a few years have gone by. But year by year, we rejoice in the Lord's faithfulness. And we can say, like it says in the book of Samuel, Ebenezer, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And because of his help, we're here again tonight. Thank you for praying for us, for Yvonne and myself. We appreciate that so very much. And us as a family, as we continue to serve the Lord in our Glad Tidings, our program, and other services as well throughout the country. We are kept quite busy, but we're thankful for that and appreciate the help and strength that the Lord has given us to continue in the battle for him and for his glory. So, Ian, yes, it is lovely, and Iris, lovely to see you both again uh, this, uh, this year, and again, as I've said, others of you, and some of you tonight who are visiting with us, we pray the Lord will meet with all of us together. We're going to read together tonight now from the Gospel according to St. John, uh, to uh, read from chapter 3, John's Gospel, chapter 3, just as a platform to lead us off into my message this evening. There weren't very many people at this service, just two, the Lord Jesus Christ and a seeking man called Nicodemus. That's a very familiar story to those who are acquainted with the Bible. John's Gospel, chapter 3, and commencing to read at verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen. And ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Ending there at verse 21, the conclusion of that conversation between our blessed Savior and that very uh, important man called Nicodemus. Now, you've been sitting for a little while, and I think for a short moment, can we stand together for prayer just to change your position, and you can limber up a little bit just in case arthritis gets a hold of you before the end of the service. Not that I'm going to be too long, mind you, but it'll help. Dear Lord, we thank you for the music and ministry already tonight and the hymns and songs that we've been singing. And we come now to thy precious word with open hearts and desire to hear thy voice speaking through thy truth. And I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will take the word of God and the message tonight and speak into our hearts through the words that will be shared and that in everything Jesus Christ will be glorified. We pray for thy drawing power on those who are not saved. We pray for thy stirring ministry in those who are and that together, Lord, as we leave the house of God this evening, we will say in our hearts, I'm glad I was there. God spoke into my heart this evening. Now speak, Lord, in the stillness while we wait on thee, hushing our hearts to listen in expectancy. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. I brought a book with me this evening that really has inspired me in the message that I want to share with you. And the title of it is, Before We Kill You and Eat You. So you know it's going to be quite gory. Before We Kill and Eat You. And it's an amazing story. It's a missionary story. It's about a Henry and Ruth Garlock, Pentecostal holiness missionaries, who left the United States of America in 1920 and went to Liberia as missionaries to reach the cannibals and the headhunters amongst the people in Liberia, to be my pioneer missionaries where my white man had never been and the gospel had never been shared. And as they went, Henry going before and Ruth then coming about a year later and they being married when she arrived in Liberia, they started their missionary ministry in 1920, just a little over a hundred years ago. They carried out an amazing ministry, and God miraculously preserved their lives on many occasions. And indeed, on one occasion, when they were right in the midst of a cannibalistic group of people, and their lives were right on the line. And the record of the intervention of God is really one of the most stirring accounts that I've ever read and heroic missionary ministry of this couple. Henry went home to be with the Lord in 1985 or 86, and dear Ruth went home to be with the Lord on the 19th of January, 1997, not so very long ago. And she was 99 years of age whenever the Lord took her home. God's wonderful ministry through them opened up that interior part of Liberia where some other friends that we have known have missioned in years since then. Wesley Bell and his wife were also missionaries in Liberia and others that we have heard of down through the years. But this couple gave their lives and put their lives on the line to carry the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to a people who had never, ever heard it. In the farewell service for them before they left America, there was a preacher who pre preached and spoke at their farewell service, and his name was the Reverend George Howard. And when George Howard was sending them off on missionary ministry, he made a statement that really gripped me that I built a message on then, 
and want to share with you now. And he said in sending them forth that we have, first of all, a humanity that is too precious in the sight of God to neglect. A humanity that is too precious in the sight of God to neglect. My dear people tonight, the reason why our blessed Savior left heaven's glory and came into this world is because God loved a world of sinners lost. And every single human being is infinitely precious to the eternal God. And of course we are precious to him, ladies and gentlemen, because he made us. The crowning creation of the triune God was to say, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And out stepped from the hand of God a created human being who bore the very DNA of God in his being. God's image stamped in him. And that's what makes you and me unique to all the other created beings in the world. In that we have a capacity to worship God. There has never been a tribe that has been found that doesn't worship something. If they haven't got a knowledge of the true God, they will create a God. And it's true to say that man is incurably religious. And that's why we are, because God made us. We do not come from monkeys. We might act like them sometimes, but we don't come from them. We came from the hand of God, created beings. Not only are we unique and precious to God because he, he made us, and loved us, but we are unique and precious to God because he has made us as creatures for eternity. God hath put eternity in our hearts. We are not creatures merely of time. We are creatures of eternity walking the courts of time, and time is gliding swiftly by, and for every single one of us, eternity is coming. We were driving the other day on the road and we came by on the way home from uh, Dungannon coming through there on this side of Money Moor. And right there on the side of the road is a big word near a gospel hall, eternity. Eternity. And we used to sing an old hymn and you probably know it and it's really true to a point. Where will you spend eternity? And really the answer is, uh, really it should be, where will you be in eternity? Because eternity will never be spent. Never be spent. This question comes to you and me. What will your answer be? Where will you be in eternity? We are creatures of a day. Our lifespan is brief. How long is life? A man said, look, and he was a writer in the Bible. He's the man of God, the psalmist. My days are as a handbreadth. My days are as a weaver's shuttle. Years ago, we were in the outer Hebrides, and we went into a weaving house where a farmer there in his little croft had a weaving loom that he made Horace tweed. And when he was weaving, the shuttles were flying backwards and forwards, faster than the human eye can follow them. Our lives are like a weaver's shuttle, my dear men and women. And looking at some of you, there's more years behind in your life than there are ahead. And someone from this congregation will be the next one to pass on into the great eternity. There will be some of us who will be the first, next first one from this congregation in Mount Calvary this evening. If it was to be you, where would you be in the great eternity? We have a humanity that is too precious in the sight of God to neglect. Young Henry Garlock got a burden for the people of Liberia. God spoke into his heart. His young bride-to-be, Ruth, got the call as well. His sister, Blanche, went with him in the original journey, coming all the way from America, through Liverpool, down to Sierra Leone, up then into Liberia. And many of the missionaries that went in those days, most all of them died within a few months or a very few years. 
because of malaria. It was the white man's grave. What was it that drove them to do what they did, to go where they went? It was because they believed that people were precious. And people are precious. You might think, Eric, nobody cares about me. I'm not important. Don't you believe that? The devil will tell you that. You are valuable. You are precious. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. God has a big purpose for you. And I'll share that with you in a little while. But that's the first thought that I leave with you. There's no one in the gathering this evening. No one that's unimportant. Young people, you are extremely important to the Lord. He has a marvelous plan for your life. I look back now, 61 years now, in another month or so since I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Young, strong, and free, 16 and a half years of age, now nudging closer to 80 years of age than 70. But I look back tonight. And I'm so thankful that the Spirit of God got a hold of my young life and called me into the service of Jesus. And if it hadn't been, I wouldn't be here. And I would never have met you. And I wouldn't have had the experiences that I've had. And so I say to you again tonight, you are precious to him. And he loves you so very, very much. And it's demonstrated in the sacrifice of Calvary. And that brings me to my second point. The second thing that was said at that valedictory is this, that there, we have a remedy for the ills of the world that is too wonderful to withhold. We have a remedy for the ills of the world that is too wonderful to withhold. There were a people who had never heard the gospel, who lived in superstition, who lived in fear, who fought against each other in tribal battles, and when they got somebody, they skinned them alive, they cooked them up, and they ate them. My dear people, they needed someone to come to resolve the ills that they were experiencing. But we live in a modern world where there are many ills that are not like those ills. And we live in a world tonight where if you were to listen to the news day after day, you'd probably finish up very depressed. But there's a deeper ill than the ills that plague society. There's an ill in the human heart. And the need of the heart is the heart of the need. And you say, well, Eric, what is that? Well, it's just a very small word, but a very big problem. And it's the problem of rebellion against God, and it's called sin. For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin is not small in the eyes of God. There are no white lies in the eyes of an eternal and holy God. There is nothing that will pass the test in our lives naturally in the great test of God's holiness and God's law. And because of that tonight, we are condemned already sinners. And if we were to receive our just deserts, we would not be allowed to live. It is of the Lord's mercy, says the Bible. Did you hear that? It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. You are here tonight because of the mercy of God. And the remedy for the ills of the human heart is found in the centrality and power of the cross work of Jesus. Oh, the glory of the cross. Oh, the majesty of that event when God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man, as Charles Wesley put it, whenever he laid aside his glory and came down and walked amongst men and talked and was scoffed and mocked and ridiculed and misrepresented. No wonder he was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And after it all was taken and by wicked hands was crucified. He saved others, himself he cannot save. If thou be the Christ, 
come down from the cross. Save thyself and come down. I'm so glad he didn't. We wouldn't be here if he had. But he paid the price in full. He bore it all. He took my sin. He took my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, my dear people, this evening, what a glorious message, the message of the cross. It reaches where no other remedy can reach. It transforms as no other power can transform. Though it is to the foolish and those that perish foolishness, it is to those who are saved the power of God. And ladies and gentlemen, something goes through my heart and spirit like a galvanic battery charge when I come to the message of the cross. Hallelujah. Satan's battle on Mount Golgotha when the hordes of darkness swept around the cross in one mighty bid to prevent that event taking place. My friends, the champion rose through it all and came out the other side a victor over sin and death and hell. And over the all of sacred history, there's the sublime glory of the cross of Jesus. Amen? Yes. You're not sleeping, I hope. I ask you, have you been to the cross? Could such an event have taken place? Could such a battle have been fought and won? Could such a victory be secured? Could such an offer be made and you be without Jesus? Could such a mighty defeat of the hordes of darkness have taken place and you still be bound by them? That to me is a mystery. And if it, isn't, if it wasn't for the fact that I believe the Bible when it says the God of this world hath blinded the minds of those that believe not, I could scarcely take it in. But it would have to be a power like the power of Satan and the devil to keep a man in blindness and a woman in bondage when such a glorious freedom has been purchased at such tremendous cost. And tonight, because I believe the grace of God is greater than the power of sin, I believe that you can be delivered from it and you can be brought into freedom in Jesus Christ. For where sin aboundeth, grace doth much more abound. Hallelujah. Amen. Why let the devil have the victory? Why let sin be your enslaving bondage whenever Calvary's sacrifice can set you free? And he defeated the powers of darkness. And in his glorious resurrection, and in ascended power, he came and spoke to John the Apostle and the Divine in Patmos when he was there in exile for the cause of Jesus Christ. Long after the sacrifice, long after the resurrection. And John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. This is the Lord's day. It's good to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Amen. And he said, I saw one. His voice was as the sound of many waters. His feet burned like brass, burning brass. And he said, I heard him said, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. I hold the authority. Who rules? Jesus rules. Who reigns? Our blessed Savior reigns. Aren't you glad tonight that we're on the victory side? Praise God this evening for the triumphs of the cross. Thank God tonight for the worthiness of the Lamb, the precious Lamb of God. Some years ago when a gentleman who has now gone with the Lord and I were dealing with a demon-possessed person, there was a dominant demon. 
And we came to the point in the event whenever Mr. McCormick, retired veterinary surgeon, now gone home to be with the Lord, who was involved in the ministry, and he said to that dominant demon, Tell me in the name of Jesus, were you at Calvary? Did you see what happened at Calvary? In the name of Jesus Christ, tell me. He said he was there. I was there. I saw what happened. And who is the victor? In the name of Jesus, tell me, who's the victor? And that demon spirit said, the white lamb of Calvary. Yes, said Mr. McCormick. The white lamb of Calvary is the victor, and in the name of Jesus you leave that body. Come out of that person. And I can tell you tonight that Jesus Christ is the victor. Devilry is real. Satan is real. Demonic power is real. More proliferated in society than you might like to think about. But I want to tell you that Jesus is real. And his name is real. And his power is real. And his victory is real. And tonight, you and I and everybody who wishes and wants to be can be set gloriously free and have the victory. Yes, there is a remedy for the ills of the world that is too wonderful to withhold. That's why they got on boats in those days and sailed the ocean and went to Liberia to reach the people who had never been reached. We have a Christ who is too glorious to hide, was the third thought. We have a Christ who is too glorious to hide. You know, it says in the Bible, in the Gospels, he could not be hidden. He was in the house, and he could not be hidden. You can never hide the Jesus that we know. He illuminates everywhere he goes. He is light everywhere he is. And when he came into the world, he said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Why walk in the darkness when you can walk in light? You wouldn't do it naturally. If you went out in a dark night, go out tonight, you don't need a lamp. There's a full moon out there. I said to Yvonne when we were leaving the house tonight, and the moon was shining. I said, I'm glad I'm not a lunatic. <laughs> it doesn't affect me whether the moon is just a sliver or a full moon. But I'm glad tonight. Maybe you think I'm affected. <laughs> but I want to tell you, wherever Jesus is, there's light. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face or in the person of Jesus Christ. Wherever he is, there's light. Nicodemus was in the darkness. He came in the darkness of a dark night, and he came in the night of his soul. But I'm glad that Nicodemus came into the light of the glorious freedom and liberty and light of Jesus Christ. Because in the council he took the side of the Savior, and in the last, in the last day of our Savior's earthly life, after he passed, Nicodemus was there to help Joseph to put his body in the tomb. Nicodemus came through. Would you come through? Would you come to know this Christ? And whilst this man, so intellectual, so clever, was grappling with these great issues and didn't fully understand, our Savior reached right back into the Old Testament and said, Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And Nicodemus knew exactly what he was talking about. And then he brought him right through, right through 1,300 years of history and said to him, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think the penny dropped when he began to share in bringing Old Testament history into New Testament experience and applying it into the life of Nicodemus. There weren't many people 
just Jesus and Nicodemus. And that was all that mattered. And there are people here tonight, many people, but it's one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. He sees you, not as a congregation. He sees you as an individual. When Yvonne and I do our story, our, our broadcast, I know that out there, there are many, many people. Many are thousands of miles from us. And they see us. But when we're speaking, we don't feel as if we're speaking to many people. We're speaking to one. One here, one there, one somewhere else. And the Holy Spirit who's here tonight is speaking to one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. And before you this evening, in all his radiant beauty, there stands the sweet rose of Sharon, the sweet lily of the valley, the sweet Savior, who is altogether loved. You say, Eric, I see no, nothing attractive about him. I can't see it. Well, Isaiah said that. There's no beauty that we should desire him. That's unbelief. But when the seed of faith is born in the heart, he begins to appear, appear in all his radiant beauty. And we are disarmed and brought to fall at his feet. And say, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the pleasures of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. A few years ago in a harvest thanksgiving service, there was a young lady sitting in the congregation. She had come all the way from Poland. She was working in Enniskillen. And she had come to the harvest service that evening because her host had invited her to come. And as this service proceeded, and I was speaking that night on the text, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And it appeared on the screen. And as she looked at it, she thought, what does that mean? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And as the message began to unfold, I saw her, and her head began to drop down and down. Beautiful young lady. And at the end of the service, when I gave an invitation, she and another lady sought the Lord that night. And as I counseled her just in the seat after the people had gone, and she got down on her knees and she came to the cross of Calvary and sought the Lord Jesus Christ. She had been a religious Roman Catholic young woman in Poland. And when she rose up, there was a light shone over her face and she looked at me and she said, I never thought I could be so near in my head because she was very religious, but so far away in my heart. God wants to bring you from a head knowledge of these things to a heart experience. And Paulina, her life was transformed. She returned to Poland to begin to work with addicted people and reach others for Jesus Christ. Would it be that maybe there's somebody this evening, a young person, older person, you're near to God in your head in that you're religious. You're not a heathen in Liberia. But you're as lost as they are. And you need to come, not head first, but heart first to the cross. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Why? Because he's no longer hanging on a cross. He's alive. 
and he lives to save the whosoever will come. But before the missionary meeting concluded, there was one final thought that was left with those people. Here is an adventure that is too exciting to miss. Here is an adventure. We have an adventure that is too exciting to miss. And once you step out from sin and darkness, once you come to the cross of Calvary, you come into a living relationship and you come into the beginning of an adventure that when you look back in years to come, you will thank God for that moment whenever you step into the grace of Jesus Christ. When you came as a sinner to the Savior, you will look back to the 5th of February, 2023, and say, it was there. I was there when it happened. And it set me on a journey that I never dreamed was possible. I began to live. And I look back, as I say, and I never dreamt as a boy in a farm in County Tyrone, working among sheep and cattle and pigs and hens and barley and potatoes. I never dreamed that I would ever be what I've been, that I would ever be called to anything other than that. But God had a plan. God had a plan. And what an amazing adventure it has been. Neither did Yvonne dream as a little girl when she came to Jesus Christ at 10 years of age that God would take her on the journey that he has taken her on. And we have traveled and we've been here and there in so many different places and seen so many different people of so many different colors. And as we look out at them and on them, we see a humanity that is too precious in the sight of God to neglect. No matter who they are or what their background or culture, we know that we have a remedy for the ills that plague their hearts. The cross work of Jesus. We know that we have a Christ who is too glorious to keep hidden. Let him out and let him shine. And tell others about him, for we have heard a joyful sound. Jesus saves. And there's an adventure that is too exciting to miss. We all like an adventure. I can tell you there's no venture to parallel the adventure of living for Jesus. And do you know what? It's not really begun. Because in the moment whenever we cross over and we start down the golden streets and through the pearly gates and the angels are waiting and they sing and the song of the redeemed and the ransomed, my friends, the story is only begun. Yes. So with that in their ears and those convictions in their hearts, young Henry and Ruth, and Blanche set off to pour out their lives to reach the people who needed Jesus. We're not in that environment now, but we're in a similar situation. You have the same need. God has the same answer. And you have the same responsibility. What will you do with Jesus. Will you trust him? My invitation comes to you with all the authority of this book and all the authority of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And it's to you. And you are invited. Are you ready to come? Wouldn't this be just the night that you should come? 
and then you too might be a missionary. The Sunday school teacher said to a little boy in her class, Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, it depends on who gets me. If God gets me, I may be a missionary. If the devil gets me, I may be a gangster. Who's going to get you? Who's going to rule your life? Who's going to take you down into the river? I know who's taking me there and across to the other side. It will be Jesus. Dear loving Lord Jesus Christ, we so thank you this evening for the gospel, good news. There is no better news. There's not much good news on the media, but we thank you that we have a book that's filled with good news. The glorious news of a Savior who came, lived, died, lives again, and is coming soon. And Savior, we pray this evening that for those of us who know the Savior, that we will take these thoughts and mull them over in our hearts and help us to see people as precious even in Balamani and wherever we live. Too precious to neglect. Help us to see people who have got ills, problems, burdens too heavy to bear, and that we might be the loving hand and the touch of kindness that will lift them up and cords that broken will vibrate once more. We pray this evening, Lord, that we shall not hide Christ under a bushel. Let our light shine so that others seeing our Jesus may be attracted to him. And I pray that no one will miss the adventure of being led by the sovereign Lord along the path of God's appointment. Oh, my Father, what a privilege. What a glorious privilege. O oh Lord, write thy word into our hearts, we pray. And anyone tonight, dear Savior, and we know there are those this evening who have never been to the cross, who have never experienced that life-transforming, delivering power. And we pray, Lord, this night that someone will come just as they are to the Savior. God bless the closing hymn and the time that we will fellowship afterward in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you each one and Pastor Fairley is coming just now to lead us in our closing hymn. But if you want to speak to us, we will be here and Pastor will be here and we are just finger posts point you to the Savior. God bless you each one. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Eric. That was a brilliant message, beautiful message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise his wonderful name. Thank you, brother, for that beautiful word. We're going to sing a, a closing hymn together as the ladies are finishing off the uh, supper. And uh, we're going to sing, Once Far From God and Dead in Sin, No Light My Heart Could See. We're going to stand as we sing. <laughs>
for the wonderful message. Thank you for the beautiful songs of Zion that were sang. And Father, thank you for every head bowed in your presence. Now, Father, as we go for supper, we pray that you'll bless the hands that have prepared it. And Father, bless our fellowship together, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God richly bless you.